How's it going? It's going really well. Thanks for having me. I'd imagine it's going pretty well for you too. Listening back to that 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 record. Uh, yeah, things are feeling pretty good. The record's been out now for five days, so uh, it's early infancy, and I think uh, it's uh, getting pretty good reviews, and people are happy to hear it. I feel real satisfied with it. So we'll see how it goes. We're starting a tour in about a month. Congrats on this! It, it, not just on making your sixteenth album. But a, a solid one that's resonating with fans and critics. After 16 albums, do you still worry about how a new one's going to be perceived when you put it out? Uh, well, yeah, constantly. I mean, w the, the problem with having such a long history of albums is getting over the question, why put out another one? <laughs> but and what's the answer to that? The, well, there's no simple answer, except we've always looked at songwriting and performing as kind of a refinement of a craft you know and it's if you are passionate about your craft you try to improve and uh, that's what we've tried to do in all some ways years. refining one's craft seems like um anth antithetical to punk rock would it be uh well it depends on your perception of punk you know punk has been uh, i think misconceived mm. uh, throughout its history i've tried to stand in opposition to that misconception uh, you know, I'm not nihilistic. Mm -hmm. I don't take drugs. Um, maybe I'm kind of boring. <laughs> but uh, the one thing that remains true, I think, is what something that resonated with me when I was a teenager was y people shouldn't be so predictable. And I, you know, I always valued the fact that uh, my heroes were not predictable and uh, they weren't easy to put into a, a pigeonhole. Well, okay, two things I want to pick up on. First, you, you said you've heard it's uh, it's gotten great reviews right before we hit the air. You said you don't really read the reviews. You like to hear from a third party. <laughs> what? So I'm telling you the reviews are quite good. Thank why, you. why don't you read them yourself? Uh, probably I'm uh, hypersensitive. Uh, you know, I'm a sensitive uh, singer-songwriter, so... I think I don't, I, you know, it's like... It would, it uh, would hurt you? Uh, yeah. Really, really. You know, if, 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 it, it hurts. And, yeah. you know, I, I teach uh, undergraduates uh, at, at Cornell University. And nowadays, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, the, the students grade the teachers. Yeah. You know, some people, it's kind of a questionable practice. But uh, likewise, I can't read them because, like, <laughs> even if one student says that was the most boring lecture I ever heard, yeah. uh, it's... Yeah, I, I know the the rational side of my brain says you're going to get a spectrum of reviews. But the irrational, emotional side, and music is very emotional, uh, it pierces my heart. Mm. <laughs> so, it's, you know, that's why it's tough for me to read reviews. There's a, speaking of being unpredictable... I you, know you're saying toughen up, Graffin. No, I. You've been at this long. No, enough. I'm saying I'm. I, I completely <laughs> empathize. I'm. I'm exactly the same way. Although, again, I mean, this this is a surprising. You know, um, it undermines sort of myths around the punk who's not supposed to care about anything, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> except for the world that you write about. But in terms of somebody slagging you off or something like that, you, here's a sensitive soul who's kind of saying. Uh, well, that's a good point. I mean, I think most punkers are are actually really sensitive. I mean, why do you say that? Because I think the only thing that could, uh, I mean, this is speaking personally, like the only thing that it's a defense mechanism to say F the world. Can we swear on here? Probably not. We can't even play our uh, single off the album. Is your single F you? Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> well, we can call it F you. <laughs> That's go true. Half Actually, the way, there yeah. is a clean version, I think, because it's getting some airplay. You could swear, but it would have to be an accident. On, yeah. Live on the air. So now that we know that you're, it's, it's premeditated. Not a, it's oh, not allowed. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I think the only thing that motivates someone to put up such a screen to say I don't care what anyone thinks, is their 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 unbridled sensitivity. Hmm. And I think it's it's kind of like you know I, I I also as an older man now can recognize that when someone's gonna call you a name any name. And this is kind of wisdom I pass on to my kids. And I try to, you know, I, I counsel a lot of uh, college students, too, through hard times sometimes. And I tell them, look, if someone's going to criticize you, it's more a reflection of them than it is of you. And I think it's, be you know, people are inherently very fragile. And punkers might be the most fragile. That's, that's really interesting. <laughs> 
But you you do trade on being unpredictable. One of the things that's always been un- unpredictable is when the next Bad Religion record is coming out. And there was some talk a couple of years ago about this record, whether it was going to come out, and then whether this would be the last record or not, and whether this is going to be realized at all. Uh, what is the conversation after all these years you have with the guys around when you're going to make this record and, and how you get the juices going for it? Well, Bad Religion Tour is about 100. You know, on a big year, we'll do 100 shows a year. I take the fall semester for teaching, but the rest of the year is pretty much open for playing shows and whatnot. So the longest time we ever have is downtime was probably last year. We had a six-month hiatus, and um, everybody got rusty at, at our instruments, and and uh, there was never a serious thought to put this being our last album, but I know there was a lot of banter about it because mm-hmm. you're not the first interviewer to ask that question. But um, the truth is, we look at this as a way of life. You know, I mean, it, we've got 16 albums over 33 years. That's almost an album every two years if you want to average. Mm. But, um, but the truth is, so there is some predictability. <laughs> right. You know, it's like earthquakes. Right. Although you the band, mem- gonna, the band gonna... <laughs> members have changed over the years. You're um, the only constant, right? I'm the only constant, but the, other, the guys who are in the band now are my high school buddies. We, we started the band together. Right. The core of the band is me, Jay Bentley, Brett Gerwitz, and even Greg Hetson, who and plays guitar. And this is guitar. like 12 years now, you, you, this lineup, right? Yeah, but the only lineup that's changed really is the drummer, mm. just like Spinal Tap. Right. Um, Your model. We didn't lose any to Explosion, I don't think. <laughs> but um, but uh, Brooks, our drummer Brooks has been in the band for the last 12 years, right. and it's been um, great. Um, so... No signs of uh, of any uh, <laughs> explosions going on back there. Did, this is a an interesting path you've decided to take with this record on, on its release. You're you're playing a few small clubs. Um, you played the Echo in Los in Los Angeles. You just played the Horseshoe last weekend in Toronto. What do you get out of those small club shows? Honestly, uh, it's uh, uh, for me. Even though the audience can't really tell, and I know that because a couple of your people were at the show last night and yeah. they they complimented me on the show, but. Um, they don't realize that I'm petrified on stage because these little tiny shows are the first time we're playing the new material. Mm-hmm. And uh, I care about how that presentation uh, comes across. And I don't want to say they're guinea pigs, but if it doesn't go so well in the small venue, it's it makes us think twice about, hey, the, the tour is coming up in a, in, a, in a month and a half. Do we really want to play this or that song? Or how do we have to fine-tune these arrangements? A couple of steps back. Bad Religion started in 1979. You were 15 years old. Right. You've been playing gigs, and and in, in a very public way. I mean, your, your band started doing well uh, pretty quickly since you were in your mid-teens. Right. And you're still petrified when you go on stage. Yeah, even more so, because what business does a 48-year-old man have being on that stage singing about punk rock? <laughs> That's that's the but pre- you don't believe that. that is a pressure that wasn't there when I was sixteen. Right, I had every right to be there when I was sixteen. Now it's it, like you said, it's about um, how does this fit in the vein of punk rock? Is there an age on punk? Well, no. I mean, I've I've taken great um, uh, great pains to explain my worldview. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Anarchy Evolution. That book took about four hundred pages to to try and uh, make sense of this uh, complicated, um, seeming, uh, seemingly conflicting strain of my life that is uh, academic science and how it can work in parallel with punk rock. And um, per- so personally, I feel satisfied. But you're, you can't, like I said, you can't put a blinder up mm. to public perception and so the the thing that scares me most is how the music is going to come across. Uh, in these small shows, gives me sort of an intimate setting where people are supposed to be on your side and be supportive. But the reality is, a lot of them are there and they want to relive the old days. They want to they want to pretend like uh, this is where bad religion belongs, and they want to be uh, contrarian. So you know, it's it's a it makes me a little bit uneasy. This is, let me ask you about something else that might make you uneasy. There's, a, there's an interesting trajectory that this band has taken in terms of you and the rest of culture, because in a way, it almost feels like popular culture has 
is is in a process of catching up to you in terms of not just music. We're trailblazers. Well, yeah, I, I agree. look, you're that's being true. sarcastic, but musically, <laughs> that's certainly true. I mean, you listen to the, the, your stuff now, and it sounds like what a lot of bands, contemporary bands, are doing in in the pop mainstream more so. It was it was you were on the cutting edge when you were doing it 35 years ago, but now it, it sounds like people have caught up to you guys. And in terms of the urgency of the messages. Um, this is an album that does seem to be responding to the general increased awareness in the culture right now, um, in, inequality. There are songs like uh, Land of Endless, Endless Greed, uh, one of my favorite songs, Robin Hood in Reverse, which one writer dubbed an anthem for the 99%. I wonder what someone like yourself, who's been drawing attention to these kind of issues for years, makes of, say, the Occupy movement. Uh, well, I have a, uh, a love relationship with the Occupy movement, uh, just because my son, who decided to leave home, went and joined the Occupy movement. And it was something, you know, that was uh, a little bit traumatic. It made me, um, it actually brought up a lot of uh, the feelings that went into writing this album. And uh, I think um, the fact that uh, young people are being rebellious and that young people are questioning something of an intellectual nature uh, that is inherent in our society is a great thing. It's kind of like the punk movement of today. And because of that, I can stand behind it and feel a little pride that my son decided to rebel in that way. But you stand behind but, it in song, too. But tell, me, tell me what right. drives you to continue writing songs with that kind of urgency. Uh, I think that's part of the part of our tradition. Bad Religion is, uh, for every one of the 16 albums, there's been a, uh, a stream of, uh, of contrary opinion to the prevailing... Um, political norms and that's something that uh, I think we've gotten better at over the years uh, because it's not overt all the time you know it's metaphorical uh, and it's still good music but I think that the uh, grain of truth in that music uh, does come through when people are humming it to themselves the grain of truth to that music comes through when they're humming it to themselves. Yeah. In other words, it's not an overt uh, lecture. It's not a. You're not a. It's not a religious pulpit. Uh, it's in. But it seeps into us. It's if infecting we, if we... people through the entertainment channel, and I believe strongly that that's the most effective channel you can use. To Sounds like the the, the underpinning things. of what you're saying is if you write an accessible melody or a song that people want to sing, the the lyrics. Um, will be easier to adopt. In a sense. I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say that by infecting them with music, uh, you give them, uh, you wake up part of their brain and you force them to come to terms with harder concepts. It's kind of the, the best of, uh, the best thing you can hope for as a teacher too, mm. to wake people up, to get them to think on their own time and to come to terms with some challenging questions instead of uh, cramming it down their throat. Infecting sounds malevolent somehow. Well, one of our biggest songs is called Infected, as you know. Right, but, right. But, but uh, <laughs> infecting is something that um, it, it's taken on uh, a malevolent meaning, but it doesn't have to be. When, when we eat yogurt, we're essentially inoculating ourselves. We're infecting ourselves with organisms. So, See, yeah, that freaks me out. Sorry. <laughs> but I know you're right. It yeah. just freaks me out. Uh, <laughs> Just to, to stay with this for a second, in terms of the urgency and where you're at, where you're at now, and and you said earlier that what business does a 48 year old um, have, and you said earlier what business does a 48 year old have up there, um, you 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 know the the regular path or or I suppose the stereotypical path is for um, a heavy rock or a punk rock musician to mellow with age. I call it the Eric Clapton effect. Um, <laughs> to put a name to it uh, at his expense. But that's not what's happening with you, at least not on this record. Um, can you reflect on that? Well, yeah, mellowing with age. I think I talk softer now than I did because, you know, I, I recognize that I'd rather save the energy for a concert than I really where I really want to uh, project my voice. And, and I mellow because I'm softer spoken. I'm not as reactive you know, like I said, I've learned how to deal with criticism mm. uh, in a more productive way by ignoring it or letting it silently kill me. Um, but I don't. It's very productive. I don't. <laughs> I don't react as much, and that comes with age, I think. But anyone who really is uh, passionate about 
improvement. And I think you can improve your life all the way up until you die. You can continue to make improvements. Physically, there's going to be some handicaps, but mentally you can continue to improve. And the way that you do that is by being aware of current events and um, not being uh, ashamed or afraid uh, to voice your opinion on them. Right, but you, you, you know what I'm getting at. Um, and I love the fact that you're, uh, you continue to push as hard as you do in your lyrics. And, uh, but the idea is when we're 19... Uh, we want to change the world because we've got the fire of a young person, the idealism, the optimism, and maybe the dreams. And that when we're 40, then somehow we're being unrealistic and we're not dealing in the quote-unquote real world if we still want to change the world. But the point, is, the truth of the matter is when you're 19, you really don't have the power uh, to change anything. Because you are driven so much by um, self-motivated um, objectives. You want to get laid. You want to be a part of a social group. Uh, when you're older, those things hopefully are Still behind Still want to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but right. the, you hopefully have become part of something right. that's bigger than yourself. And that's something you cannot... It's very difficult to achieve that. The sense of belonging to something, the sense of of purpose and i'll go as far as to say the and i don't mean ultimate purpose i don't mean the purpose that that god uh, put you on the earth for i'm talking about the purpose uh within your immediate social group isn't established when you're 19. it usually doesn't become established till you're in your 30s and at that point you actually have some power if you're privileged enough, which I feel is it's a great privilege to be in the place that I'm at, and I take that seriously, then you can. if you're privileged enough to be in a position where you can affect some change, that's when you can, uh, if you don't take advantage of that, I think you're shortchanging yourself and uh, you're shortchanging your social group. On a related note, I think, I saw you say recently that unlike some other rock bands that have been going for a long time, Bad Religion isn't a heritage band. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what you mean by that? Oh, yeah. I use that word all the time, Heritage Act. What does Act. that mean? A Heritage Act is a band that hasn't put out a record for 30 years, but they're still their song was so good 30 years ago, they're still asked to perform at casinos and things like that. And uh, there's nothing wrong with making a living that way. Those people have a great privilege as well. But they're sort of, um, they're sort of just um, you know, milking it. They're cashing in on something that was great 30 years ago. And I don't want to be that. I, I think they, it, a band that has the privilege of uh, having an audience should try and challenge the audience and themselves a little bit and put out a record occasionally. And then you, don't have to, then you won't be a heritage act. We, we try to put one out, even though you say it's a little unpredictable. It's true. Our album cycles are about between two and three years. Mm -hmm. And that's when we start to feel the itch to put out another one. You guys also, though, notoriously follow the script of the bad religion sound to a certain extent. So where does that fit in with challenging the audience? Yeah, well, uh, that's the recognition that there is a genre called punk music. And any genre, if you recognize a genre, you recognize limitations. Mm. And if you want to stay within those limitations, then, of course, uh, you're, going to be, you're going to continue the privilege of being able to affect change within those boundaries. There's no desire to make a jazz record. No. <laughs> Let me talk to you about your other line of work, because it's, you're, you're such a fascinating guy. You're also a scientist and an academic. You talked about the book you put out. If there's one idea that seems to be at the center of your work in those other fields, Greg, it's evolution. Uh, if you can put this in the simplest terms to people who are new to you or the diversity of what you do, why are you so captivated by evolution? Uh, well, I think evolution was a worldview, obviously, a worldview presented originally by Charles Darwin in the 1850s. But um, it's a worldview that was very attractive to a young punk rocker like myself. I didn't have any formal training in, in religion, and I was not brought up in a religious household, didn't go to church. I didn't learn any of the narratives that religious people learn about how special I was as a person, how I had a relationship with God, how uh, where we came from, you know, mm. and why I was put on this planet. So evolution provided a lot of that when I started reading it as a teenager. I thought, wow, this, these are, are uh, in a sense, these are narratives of origin. 
narratives of uh, at least proximate purpose. These give me some idea of what I'm doing on this planet. And it began to uh, make the world make sense to me. And why now? 30 years later, why does it continue to resonate? Uh, I think it still resonates because of those original same feelings. I want to share this narrative in a creative and interesting way with people who might not be aware of it. So the class that I teach at Cornell is called Evolution for Non-Majors. It's not for spe uh, specialists in biology. Mm -hmm. This is from a cross-section of the campus. And uh, me and my co-teacher, Rick Harrison, want to teach this class to make it uh, appealing to people who never even thought of evolution as a possible narrative uh, to make sense of their world. And what would be the ideal takeaway for one of those students coming out of that class? Uh, well, the ideal takeaway is that re that uh, evolution is not as complicated as scientists. many scientists make it sound. It's actually a very basic science, and some very basic understanding of it gives me a sense that uh, I don't have to fear it when I'm discussing it with religious people. And that's one of the most insidious problems in the country uh, is that religious people see it as a direct line to atheism. And therefore, you, you, it, it's instantly infused with this conflict. Uh, I don't think the conflict has to be there except at the most technical level of the science where it's clearly um, contradictory to theology. On, on that note... Um Bad religion has, as as the name of the band suggests, uh, been a critic, you could say, of religion for years. It seems that in one way, uh, this is a place where society has caught up to you. I was looking at a poll recently that said 20% of young Americans don't identify with any religion. Uh, young people today do seem more likely to be in a league with Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins. What's it been like to see society bend in that direction over the course of your career? Uh, I am going to say that I'm not sure that society changed as much as the um, polling and the reporting of it has changed. They've changed their uh, polling tactics to show that more people are answering none of the above when asked to identify with a religion. And that, to me, is just a reflection of the secularization of society, which I think started um, way before bad religion, you know, probably started in the 60s with the civil rights movement and things. I think those things challenged um, uh, the religious right as well. You're saying your band didn't single-handedly no. change the opinions of Americans. No, I think we were early to, I think we were early, though, to comment on it. And by cho choosing the band name, right. as we did, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, you know, we chose that name. We were fortunate to choose that name because it's a philosophical concept. Religion is something you can talk about until you get old. You can age gracefully with the name Bad Religion. You can't age gracefully with the name uh, Backstreet Boys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me... <laughs> Let me see if I could. Um, the Beach Boys, uh, as evidence, uh, just yeah. still struggle with it. Uh, um, let me try and get simplistically philosophical then, uh, keeping with the idea of evolution, but getting back to the the way bad religion has railed against uh, um, what you see is wrong with the world. Are are you, are you optimistic that society can change in dramatic ways? Uh, well. Um I have to put up a uh, I have to put up a uh, optimistic front because I believe the reason for teaching the reason even for me songwriting the reason for continuing is this optimism that it's making a difference and you know every teacher in the land has this same feeling whether you're teaching kindergartners or college students why what what motivates you to get up and do this every day is this belief that you're affecting the younger generation who are coming through, you're educating people and you're hoping for something better in the future. Uh, having said that, it's not just me, it's educators uh, since uh, time immemorial are sa have said that the times will change as the times will change. Hmm. And you have to put your own abilities uh, in the proper perspective. Full circle back to this record, back to this moment. Um, I understand all the members of the current incarnation of the band are parents? I think so. And and you're you're you have kids that are they're the age you were when you started this band, right? That's correct. So when you're on stage, say, 
uh, at the horseshoe like last weekend. Um, do you ever reflect back to being the 15, the 16 year old, um, well, being on stage for the first time? Do you have children? No. Eventually you will, and you'll see that um, your life changes when you have kids and you start to view the world from their perspective. Now that my kids are the age of uh, we were when we started um, really going going out and, and uh, uh, really experiencing the world and seeing how much uh, it bummed us out, seeing it through their perspective bums me out even more <laughs> because... A, I think the world is harder to navigate, but B, I have this connection with them, and uh, not only do I relive the the trauma that it was uh, for myself, but I now have to relive it in their shoes as well. So it's very emotional and it's uh, difficult, but um, it, in terms of it conflicting with our relationship, it doesn't. You know, this is just like, even though it's a weird job for your dad to have, <laughs> it's still their dad's job. Do they get it? They, do they think you're cool? I don't. I hope not. Man. <laughs> what, think, what do you mean? You I hope think not. Because I think there's way too much. Um, there's really too much um, emphasis nowadays on the ing on parent. You know, putting this as if parenting is a skill or something. Uh, I think there's an overemphasis on parents and kids relating to one another mm -hmm. in our society that I think is not good for the kids. So, I mean, the kids need to break, break that. They need to break any kind of conversation where you're going to talk about what's cool. What does dad think is cool? That's not good because that your world is so different from dad's. Mm -hmm. And I really believe the generation gap is getting shorter. I think it's taking less time between the generations you know i could sort of relate to some of what my parents went through but i don't think that our world today is uh anything like the world that my own kids 20 years ago if you think back to what was going on 20 years ago um they have a true different cultural milieu to adapt to and i i have backed off on commenting about it that's really interesting, man. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of feel like kids shouldn't think that their parents are cool. <laughs> Having said that, if one of your kids was wearing a bad religion T-shirt, oh yeah, we make some cool merchandise. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with wearing a shirt now and then. But... Hello, before I let you go, let me ask you and come back to the, the 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 song we played off the top. That's also the title track, True North. You singing that song, When I Find True North, is is that a sign you're still looking for direction after all these years, Greg? Yeah, that's perceptive. Um, I appreciate your analysis because uh, the idea of, you know, a lot of this song was written uh, from the perspective of a kid who's running away. And uh, I guess you could say a lot of it is kind of like a, a love letter to my own son. And um, but, but nothing is more boring than a guy who's writing songs and is lost in his own world. You know, it's just nobody cares that much. So to really make it resonate and to make it, uh, interesting. I think you have to have uh, some kind of imagery in there that shows this song isn't really about the kid. This song was about all of us. And everyone, I think, if, if you're committed to living a productive life, you've got to constantly challenge and you've got to constantly look for your own sense of truth. And that's what the metaphor in this, this song and in many of the songs on the album uh, is speaking to. And so I don't, you know, I, I'm still looking for it as well. I'm really enjoying playing this record on repeat, and it's it's really a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Man. Bad Religion frontman Greg Graffin. The new record is called True North. It's out now. Greg Graffin has been with me here live in Studio Q.